Welcome to this Mishcon Academy digital session. My name is John Sandama. I will be chairing this session for Black History Month at Mishcon Dorea. This session is entitled Operation Legacy, Empire, Archives and the Law. Here we are looking at how our image of the British Empire has been shaped by the destruction and concealment of colonial records and the broader issues that this raises. We're exploring these topics through the lens of the Mutua case brought in 2009 in the English High Court. In the case, five elderly veterans of the Mau Mau Rebellion, which took place in Kenya between 1952 and 1960, brought proceedings as representatives of a much larger group against the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, seeking damages for extreme acts of violence and torture suffered at the hands of British colonial forces in Kenya. I'm very excited and honored uh, to introduce our phenomenal panel, each of whom played a critical role in the case. Our first panelist, uh, Dr. Muthoni Wanyeki, is Regional Director of the Open Society Foundation's Africa Regional Office. Our second panelist, Professor Caroline Elkins, is a Professor of History and African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Our final panelist, Richard Herma QC, is a barrister at Matrix Chambers, where he specializes in public law and private law litigation in both domestic and international matters. Um, I'm now pleased to hand over to Mathoni, who will be discussing the genesis of the Mau Mau survivors' efforts to seek justice. So I would say there were several streams um, that came together to enable the case to happen. The first stream was the Mau Mau veterans themselves who began working with the Kenya Human Rights Commission. What the commission was trying to do was set up a process of transitional justice for all victims of mass atrocities in the, initially in the Kenyatta One and Moi eras. The second stream, which was longstanding, um, was the stream of work done by a former uh, colonial district um, officer, John Nottingham. He had, during his service in the colonial era, um, been very uncomfortable with what he had seen in terms of land removals, in terms of treatments of Kenyans and so on, and had spent a considerable part of his life trying to explore what had happened to documents he knew because he had served within the service that had been destroyed at the time. And out of that, the idea of some sort of case that would involve Lee Day, Martin Day's company, the KHRC and the veterans came together. Caroline, um, love to hear from you uh, in relation to your experiences, uh, your research and your experiences on the case. In the 1990s, when I began this project as a graduate student, I was strongly dissuaded <clears throat> from, from undertaking the project. There was clearly the knowledge that vast amounts of documentation was missing. There was certainly reason why at that time, nobody had written sort of a systematic analysis of these detention camps. And what this entailed was literally going through file after file after file, um, asking the question of what were these camps about? Who knew what? And as my research unfolded, it became clear to me that my initial hypothesis of, yes, these were camps of liberal reform, was really turned upside down. The evidence was accumulated in, in uh, many official archives in Britain, as well as in, in the National Archives in Nairobi. And I also did interviews, um, hundreds of interviews with former uh, detainees. And there was a particular document, a 1957 document that was found. And that document was a document from Governor Baring uh, to the Colonial Secretary with supplements from the Attorney General, Eric uh, Griffith Jones, which really laid out something called the dilution technique, which was a clear, the point is a clear causal link between what was happening in Kenya both the knowledge and approval of systematic violence. And when they learned, that is those in London, that the systematic violence was resulting in deaths and serious torture, they did nothing to stop it. Rather, they made actually uh, incredible efforts ex post facto to create legal mechanisms to protect those in the British colonial administration who were perpetrating these crimes. I'd like to hand over to Richard. Uh, it would be good to hear from you about your reflections on the case now that some time uh, has passed. I came into uh, the case um, later than Nathani and Caroline. I, ca I came into it because I received a call one day from Martin Day and said, I, I want you to come and meet this guy. 
he wants to tell you about a case. And so I came in and chatted and it was John Nottingham. And John fixed me with a very steely stare and explained to me in no uncertain terms why the case was going to be brought. And I, I think having kind of gone through the process of meeting John, reading Caroline's book, at the same time that Martin was as well, I think we decided that whatever the prospects in this case were, it was something that we thought had to be brought. So we had to sort of begin to fashion a case, knowing that it was legally completely novel at that stage. And, then, and as anticipated, we faced a ferocious, kind of, <laughs> ferocious response from the government. The main argument that they advanced was that the crown is divisible. So when you are attacking the actions of the colonial government in Kenya, those are in respect of the crown in right of Kenya. And so the people who are responsible for those today is a matter of, they say, Kenyan law and also international law of the Kenyan government. And then the second substantive argument, the second hearing was one we obviously anticipated, which is you can't bring personal injury cases outside three years, let alone um, 53 years. We succeeded on that first argument in the first hearing because we just pivoted the case to one of just straightforward negligence of the British government in London. And then the second hearing was in respect of limitation. And again, we just pivoted our case all about liability for the systems. And thus, our evidence was that you can just do that on the documents that you've got. We won um, both of those and then moved forward to um, a settlement process, a kind of a core part uh, of the settlement process was trying not to, was not using tort law skills, but was using essentially transitional justice skills to try and make this victim centric. And think, and, and, and thus there was real centrality to our approach, the importance of an apology. Victims want truth to be established. So that was really key. And then also as part of it was the building of a memorial. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, whether settlement affects um, you know, the, the, the ability for the, the um, victims to achieve full and comprehensive justice. Was it a perfect mechanism for this country coming to terms with the atrocities that it's responsible for in Kenya? A a absolutely not. Um, but was it a moment that allowed that story to come out, that gave voice to victims that had some degree of accountability? Then yes, compared to um, other attempts through um, using law to do that, yeah. I just wanted uh, you to, to, to reflect on, on the role of the um, Human Rights Commission and the amount of effort and, and the scale of the task um, uh, that they undertook. The brunt of it was actually borne by the Mau Mau War Veterans Association themselves. In terms of the background work, they're the ones who helped us identify once the narrowing down to torture had happened, people whose bodies or mental faculties showed um, consistency with having been tortured. At the KHRC, we had to build a database. I think there were 50,000 plus in it. Every one of those people had to be checked by a doctor to sort of make sure in and of itself, each of these 50,000 plus people were credible in terms of um, what they had gone through. They're the ones who also made the decisions with Dan, with us, on who they wanted the claimants to be. So all of that said, yes, they agreed to limit the case to torture, but they never felt their process with the KHRC was going to be just about this case. Their big issue was land and removal from land which they wanted to move forward on. And of course, many transitional justice processes were happening within Kenya in that sort of golden moment between 2002 and 2007 when everything broke down. We had a land commission. We had, you know, the, the task force on setting up the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission. So the hope was that many of these processes would get them justice and reparation in other forms and in addition to what had happened with the case. Um, what are your thoughts on, on what the case and others like it um, uh, uh, raises or reveals about the intersection between Euro European liberalism, which was a, you know, the, the virtues that were uh, publicized and, and promoted by, by empire, um, and the contradiction between the brutality of empire um, and the racial issues, that mix 
uh, of issues. In some ways, you know, when we think about liberal imperialism, um, it, it sounds like an oxymoron. And, and of course it was. We associate the civilizing mission with all sorts of, of, of sort of the markers of liberalism, right? Whether it's, the, you know, liber individual liberties, free market, rule of law. But what makes liberalism or the British Empire so much more difficult to make the, the charges of violence stick than, say, the Germans in Southwest Africa or even, you know, the Nazis in Eastern Europe is it's very clear what that project was, particularly the Hitler's empire. It was, it, it was, a, you know, it was, it was fascist. What makes liberalism so hard or quote unquote liberal imperialism is that it does have this sort of the slow ability to mete out reform, right? Even those detention camps were known as rehabilitation sites. The British colonial government and, and it will say consistently that we, this, we, we brought rule of law that what we did was legal. And they created this panoply of structures through emergency regulation. They enabled this behavior and they rendered it legal and protected from prosecution at the time. And the ways in which Britain is able to basically institute within international law, the permanent state of exception. One has to, one has to see that what's so challenging with liberal imperialism is it both illuminates, right? Release all the documents were transparent and obfuscates at the same time. It's both. And so that's why in the British Empire, when we talk about systematic you know, racism, system, all the things present today, every time you make a charge, somebody can hold up something else. What are your thoughts on how a fuller narrative around uh, Britain's colonial history can reframe the conversation around uh, issues such as government aid in Africa or development financing. If you think back to the, the days and the organizing around the UN World Conference Against Racism, you know, you saw these sort of restitution reparations movements from around the world, not just of Africa, of African Americans or Afro descendants in, in North South America, but also of indigenous people around the world who really sort of came together to make that case and try and put forward a platform for recognition, restitution, and so on. This summer, we've all lived through Black Lives Matter. I mean, globally, um, decolonize. Um, so I think we're at the, a point in time where these questions are on the table again. That said, there is a huge disconnect between those movements and on the one hand, the domestic environments that they're trying to shape, be those domestic environments, the UK, the US or whatever, there's an even further remove when it comes to the foreign policy of those countries. If you talk to any foreign policy person on questions of would you equate, you know, ODA, FDI, as a form of reparations, they'd look at you as if you're out of your mind. But I think that's probably the next sort of stage of the battle is really beginning to make that, that case. Just one final thing that I wanted to touch on um, uh, before we, we close, the experience that you had um, after the case, um, both, both you, Mathoni, uh, and Richard, in relation to the unveiling of the statue, and obviously your interactions with, with all of the, the, the veterans and the survivors at that event. Learning about history from people who lived it. I mean, there were many times that we were reduced to tears. But because we had been doing the organizing on the ground, meeting with the veterans, sort of traveling around the country to sort of talk to them and so on, I don't think I was as surprised as perhaps Richard and Philippa were when they arrived. Because of course they knew they were working with five claimants who were representative. I think they had no idea how many claimants they were working for or how many people they represented. I, I pitched up to Nairobi thinking there were gonna sort of be, you know, a couple of dozen people politely clapping as the uh, monument is unveiled. What I wasn't, what I wasn't right about was turning up in the park and there were just thousands and thousands of people and it was this enormous celebration and you know I do lots of human rights cases and you get judgments and then you see some of your clients afterwards and that's great but this was like nothing else I ever ever been part of it was just phenomenal to be there. Uh, all that's left is to thank uh, all, all three of the panelists um, thank you so much it's been a real privilege to hear you uh, tell your stories about your experiences and to hear your thoughts on these ideas. Um, so thank you so much, Richard. So thank you, Tony. And thank you, Caroline, for joining us today. Thank you.